In this video, we're going to continue looking at how a street lamp works. In particular, we're going to look at electrical energy and power. The flow of electricity delivers energy to street lights, and the street lights then use this energy to produce light. Energy has a very specific meaning in physics. We'll be defining it in a later topic when we're considering mechanics. But for now, let's just accept that electrical appliances need energy to work. So one very important rule about energy is that it cannot be created or destroyed, it's always conserved. So we can transform energy from one type to another or we can transfer it from one body to another, but we cannot create or destroy it. In electrical power plants, some of them work off coal, so you're burning coal to get some chemical energy, which is then converted into electrical energy, which flows through the electricity wires to your homes and to the street lights. If it flows to a street light, the street light then converts that energy into some light energy and a little bit of heat energy. If the electricity flows into your home, it may go into a toaster, and the toaster, on the other hand, converts it into a lot of heat energy and a little bit of light energy. So all electrical appliances require electricity, and from the electricity they get energy, which they can convert into a more useful form. Power also has a special definition in physics. Power is defined as a measure of how quickly energy is transferred. So power is equal to energy over time. In SI units, which we usually use, power has units watts, energy has units joules, and time is measured in seconds. Now, one place where you'll come across power a lot is in your electricity bills. Your electricity bills actually charge you for the amount of energy you use, not the amount of power, because power is the rate of energy, it's not the total amount of energy. Now, energy companies don't use SI units. They use a special unit called the kilowatt hour. So kilowatts, that's a thousand watts. So it's like the SI units for watts. And then the unit for time that they use for energy is equal to the hour. So we can use so we can rearrange our power equation, power is equal to energy on time, to be energy is equal to power times time. So that's how they get the units, kilowatts, hours. So this is a useful unit to use around the home because usually when you buy an appliance, it has its rating in watts or kilowatts on it and then you just multiply it by the amount of time you have that appliance on and you know how much energy it's used and so you can work out, if you know the cost of your energy, how much you're going to have to pay for it. Let's do an example of this now. You buy a new fridge that uses 40 watts on average. If energy costs 26 cents per kilowatt hour, how much does it cost to run your fridge for a year? Well, we use the formula energy is equal to power times time. So the amount of power it needs is 40 watts. We're going to want to get it into kilowatts. So if we put 40 over 1000, that's the amount of power in kilowatts. And now the time, we're interested in the number of hours we use it for. So for each day we use it, there's 24 hours and then we've got 365 days in the year. So that's how many hours there are in a year. So now 40 divided by 1,000 times 24 times 365 gives us 350.4, and that's the number of kilowatt hours that we use the fridge for. So now to get the cost, we just need to do the amount of energy times the cost per kilowatt hour. So it's 350.4 times 26 cents. Solving that on the calculator, we end up with $91.10 per year. So that's how much it costs to run a fairly normal type refrigerator. 
So let's look now at how we can calculate how much power different components in the circuit are using. We've said that power is equal to energy over time. Now previously we've said that the voltage in the circuit is related to the amount of energy that is available to push the charges or the electrons around that circuit. We've actually got a formula for that. The energy is equal to the charge times the voltage. And we've also previously defined current. Current is equal to the charge over the time. So what we can do now is we can go from our power is equal to energy over time formula by substituting in for energy. Energy is equal to charge times voltage and substituting in for the time, rearranging that current is equal to charge on time. We've got time is equal to charge on current. And so we end up with the power is equal to the voltage times the current. So using P is equal to VI, we can calculate how much power different components in a circuit use. Let's do an example of that now. So a light bulb is powered by a 9.0 volt battery and draws 200 milliamps of current. How much power does it use? To answer this question, we need to use P is equal to VI. Power is equal to voltage times current. So now we just need to substitute in. Our voltage is 9.0 volts. Our current is 200 milliamps. So that's 200 times 10 to the minus 3. This 10 to the minus 3 is for the milli. And so solving this on the calculator, we end up with 1.8 watts. And so this light globe uses 1.8 watts of power. Now what I have here is a photo of our series circuit from the last video and a picture of our parallel circuit. You can see that in the parallel circuit the light globes are much brighter than in the series circuit. This can actually be explained by the amount of power used. When you use more power you're using more energy each second and so the light globes will be a lot brighter. Let's look at the values we had from the last video and just calculate the approximate power being used by each of these light globes. So in the series case we found that the current through each light globe was around about 2.3 milliamps and that the voltage drop across each light globe was approximately equal to 4 volts. And so the power used in this case is just given by VI, which is equal to 2.3 times 10 to the minus 3 times 4. And so solving this, we have 0 0.0092 watts. In the parallel case, we found that the current through each globe was on average 4.2 milliamps and that the voltage drop across each globe was 12 volts. And so in this case, P is equal to VI, which is equal to 12 times 4.2 times 10 to the minus 3. And solving this on the calculator, we get 0 0.0504 watts. So you can see this number is much larger than this number. And so that is why the light globes were much brighter in the parallel case. Now governments want to use very efficient lights for street lights because they have to pay the bill for keeping the street lights on. So they're going to look for the most efficient type of light. The other thing that they need to take into consideration is the colour of the light. Because we've evolved on Earth with the sun, we like yellowy light and our eyes are much better at dealing with yellow light than with light which is red or blue. So if we have red or blue lights, we actually need to put in a bit of extra power to get a bit more intensity so that our eyes can detect those lights. So let's go and look at some different types of lights now. First of all, let's look at this incandescent light. 
Incandescent lights work because they've got a little very narrow metal filament. It's a very narrow wire that the current has to flow through. As the current flows through the wire, it heats the wire up. Now hot things radiate light energy. This is called black body radiation. So imagine a blacksmith puts a cold lump of metal into a fire. As it heats up, it starts to glow red. And then if he manages to get the fire a bit hotter, heat it up a bit more, it'll go through orange. And if he managed to keep on heating it up and getting it hotter and hotter, it'll go through yellow and green and blue. That's because it's producing light at all different wavelengths, but as it gets hotter and hotter, the predominant wavelength gets shorter and shorter and shorter, which means it gets closer and closer to blue and further and further away from red. We'll be considering that a bit more in the next video as well. But coming back to this incandescent light, this is working because the Electrical energy is going into heating up the filament and that filament is then producing a little bit of light energy. So this is actually very inefficient as a way of lighting because a lot of the energy is going into heat energy rather than into light energy. If you touch a incandescent bulb, it's very hot and you'll burn yourself, so don't do that. But um, supermarkets have now banned the sale of these tungsten filament globes, which are incandescent lights, because they are so inefficient. With people being more concerned about global warming and energy efficiency now, they've just made the decision to stop selling them. So let's have a look at some of the other types of lights that are available. What we've got here is an LED light. LED lights also require some current to work, but they're much more efficient at converting that electrical energy into light energy. One of the big differences about the light produced by an LED to the light produced by an incandescent light is that LEDs only produce light with a very limited wavelength. So the, this one is a green LED, so it's only producing light with a green wavelength of around about 450 nanometers. These LED lights are much more efficient because they're just using that electrical energy to produce the light and the lights of the specific wavelength that we want. Now one of the downsides of these LEDs compared with the incandescent lights is that this incandescent light is producing a whole spectrum of colours. This one's producing quite a lot of yellow light like the sun. So if you have this light on in a room, the room feels nice and warm, feels a bit like a sunny day, and we've evolved to light, like light with that wavelength and also with that spectrum with a lot of light with other wavelengths as well. So LED lights can seem a bit cold and stark in comparison because there's just the single wavelength or almost the single wavelength being produced by them. So because LED lights are much more efficient than the incandescent lights, traffic lights have been being replaced by LED lights. So traffic lights will have a whole lot of little red dots or little green dots on them, which are a whole lot of LEDs. We need lots of them so that we can get the, enough intensity for you to be able to easily see the light so that you know if you should stop or go. So at the moment, this green light is a bit less intense than this incandescent one, and that's just because this one's being powered by a small battery, and this one is being powered. There's a lot more energy going through it from this power supply. So let's have a look at another type of light now. Street lights are actually mainly metal halide lights. How metal halide lights work is you've got a chamber filled with gas, you've got glass or something which is transparent to hold the gas in place, and you then send current into that chamber and you get electrical arcs which light up the gas. This, this causes a plasma to form within the gas, which means all the little electrons around the nucleuses get enough energy to be disassociated and move away from that nucleus. And then when the electrons come back and join up with the nucleus again, they produce the light. 
So let's have a look at a couple of examples of lights using this type of technology. What we've got here is a mercury lamp. You can see it's a bluish colour. With these gas discharge lamps, metal halide lamps, they can take a little minute to heat up and to reach their final colour. This lamp here has a different type of gas in it. It's got sodium gas in it. This one has sodium gas in it. So you can see this produces a more yellowy light and this mercury gas is a more bluish light. Some street lamps contain sodium gas, other street lights contain mercury along with a mixture of other type of gases as well. So these lights are much more efficient than the incandescent light, which is why governments have installed these lamps into street lights. Astronomers like them to use these sodium lights because sodium has a very specific wavelength, 589 nanometers, and if they know the wavelength of the light, then they can account for it and subtract it from the measurements that they take. So let's just have a look at one other type of light now. I'm just going to turn that light on for you. This is a room light. So these room lights are fluorescent lights. They work in a very similar way to this gas discharge tube light, except that on their coating, they have what's called a fluorescent material. So the gas inside the fluorescent lights actually produces wavelengths in the UV range, which we can't see, but that UV range then interacts with the fluorescent coating on the outside of the lamp and that interaction produces light with a visible wavelength. So that's how we see in most rooms. So in this video, we've been considering electric power. We've got two formulas that we can use to calculate power. Power is equal to energy over time, or power is equal to voltage times current. The first one we use if we know the energy and the time involved. The second one we use if we've got an electric circuit and we need to use and we need to work out how much power flows through different components. To be efficient, we want as much of that electrical energy being converted to the type of energy that we want, so light energy for a light, or for example, heat energy for a heater, and as, as little as possible of the energy being converted into unuseful forms, which can include heat energy or sound energy, depending on the situation. In the next video, we're going to discuss the photoelectric effect, which is the first bit of evidence we have for quantum mechanics. And this is going to tell us about how streetlights know when they should turn on at night. I'd like to give special thanks to Jonathan Horner for his input into this video and for filming it.